I have no idea what verse for him. Do we do we cast lots for Matthias last week? Yes. We, we all we did was read it. We didn't discuss it. That's what I mean. Right. The questions. How, do we discuss anything in chapter one? No. Oh, no. good. All right. I'm prepared. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm prepared. I, I'm prepared to do the first three chapters cold. Actually, I'm not going to write a whole lot of stuff. But, all right. Uh, do we want to read chapter one again? Yes. All right. Chapter one, verse one. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers, the company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong. He burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out, and it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let no one, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So, one of the men who had accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two: Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Okay. Questions to keep in mind for chapters 1 and 2. What was Jesus' last instructions to the apostles, and why was this command given last? What was the apostles' last question they asked Jesus, and why did they ask it? How many disciples gathered in Jerusalem? How long were they there? Imagine you were there. What do you think that was like? Why was it important to replace Judas? Why do we never hear about casting lots in the Bible ever again after this? These are hypothetical questions. There's no right answer to that last one. Okay. So, chapter 1, verse 1, uh, we have, as a, well, if you weren't here for the introduction, we can go over this a little bit briefly. So, we think Theophilus, which means uh, he who loves God or um, lover of God. It, some people say that that was just a title uh, given to everybody that's going to read the book, but that's kind of hogwash. Uh, Most people believe Theophilus was an actual living person, that he was wealthy, that he was the patron of Luke who paid to have this book and his gospel published because that took, you know, money. And we talked about back in the introduction about how much that would cost today and what the process was for getting a book published uh, back then and why, you know, like a two-volume work was kind of a big deal. So like a Luke Acts thing, they were always put next to each other for a long time. 
why that would be a good thing that people would like because the literary, the quality of literature that people heard like after dinner or at parties, uh, that was their entertainment or reading when uh, they read it themselves, which meant reading it out loud to yourself uh, was a big form of entertainment also. So quality literature, producing quality literature was important and it was not cheap. Plus he had to do all this traveling. He had to do this traveling. He had to interview people because he, you know, well, how does he know what Mary's saying when the angel came? Because he went and asked her, she's still alive. He interviewed her for good reporting. So he went around, he got eyewitness accounts because eyewitness accounts is an important uh, thing for Luke and Acts. So Luke is receiving funds to help fund this project for the good of the church. Uh, and as we know from the beginning of the book of Luke, uh, the other gospels are, are written, other than John comes later. But, you know, Matthew and Mark are circulating around and Luke says, hey, Theophilus, you know, I thought it was good that I too would go and, you know, fact check all this stuff. I mean, we all know it's true, but hey, let's do it again. So we make another account, which was going to be uh, accurate eyewitness accounts of all the things that Jesus said and did, all the surroundings, circumstances surrounding his birth and his life. Um, so someone had to pay for it. That's Theophilus. So he talks about that's what his first book was about. It was everything that Jesus began to do and teach until he uh, ascended into heaven. And then Acts starts with the same thing. So Luke ends with the Ascension, and Acts begins with the Ascension. So you have two accounts back to back because that's kind of how you, when there's cliffhanger, when there's cliffhanger previously on, right, the birth of the church, we saw Jesus ascend to heaven, so we show it again, right? Kind of how we do it today on shows, same thing. Ends the book, introduces the new book with the same scene. Stylistic flair. Uh, and then he also says, hey, you know, he also may put in all these appearances after the resurrection. You know, again, we're talking about, you know, this eyewitness testimony. So there he presented himself alive, not a ghost, alive to them by many proofs. Like, what kind of proofs? Like, stick your hand in here and in here and see, it's me. And just because I materialized through a locked door, I still eat. Ghosts don't eat. Go still teach, you know. Uh, so we, all these proofs, talking about the kingdom of God that's coming, and you know, proving that He is who He says He is still. And said, "Okay." And they're staying. Hey, they're still staying here uh, because He told them to. So when they had come together, they said, "Verse six: Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel?" Okay, so they don't get it. Niners, I know why I think I did all this already, because confirmation class just did Acts 1-2. It's having deja vu. Uh, so the disciples are still clueless. Jesus is getting ready to leave, and they're still clueless. Will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus doesn't answer the question. Because you know, that's what Jesus does, right? He says, you... You heard from me, for John baptized with water, you will be baptized with water. Uh, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. So is now the time? I'm not telling you that. Because Jesus knows what he means, and in not many days from now when they receive the Holy Spirit, then all of a sudden they're going to go, oh, yeah, okay, now we know what he means. That it's not an earthly kingdom, even though he told him like a million times. My kingdom is not of this world. Okay, but you're going to establish your kingdom in this world now, right? No, guys, no. Okay, kingdom of heaven, got it. Where'd he go? What do we do, <laughs> right? They're still clueless. Uh, but they will receive power from on high, as Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. So why are the, how many, how many days? How many days between Easter and or technically the day before Easter, and Pentecost. 50? 50, 50, Penta. All right, so it's been 40 days. It's been the 40 days. He's been in and out 40 days. Now he's ascended, and then 10 days later, so not many days from now, week and a half, guys, stay here. Holy Spirit's going to come. 
The Holy Spirit can't come unless Jesus leaves. And then says, yeah, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. So what, what, what was the significance of the 50 days? Why was it 50 days? And it's not some numerological logical thing. I mean, it's a, it's a calendar thing. It's a church calendar thing. Why 50 days? Why, why 50 days? Did the, why was Pentecost 50 days after, oh. after Easter? So what was the day before Easter? Passover. Passover. So it's something <clears throat> by one calendar. Different. Yep. So this is a festival, right? Because In Jerusalem, this was, and that's why it, all the people. Were. So this was a high Sabbath because the Passover well, Passover is on the Sabbath, and it's also the festival of. And you could say Pentecost because that's actually what it's called, but festival of booths, right? So this was in the Old Testament where they they set up booths, like tabernacle, and you set up booths, and they lived in them uh, for fifty days as a remembrance of the Exodus and their wandering. So they would set up these booths to remember what it was like to wander the desert for forty years. So it's the festival of booths, and what happens at these big festivals? What, where, who's there? This is Jerusalem. So Jews from all around the world come there. Right, which we'll hear at the beginning of chapter 2. And in, in, They were in Jerusalem, Jews from every nation. It, it starts out. So you've got Jews make their pilgrimage to Jerusalem for this big festival that they're supposed to do as often as they can. Um, so Jews from all over the world are there. So Jesus says, stay put. You don't have to do anything. They're going to come to you. So the Holy Spirit's going to come to you, and the church is going to start here in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And he said these things, and as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. So a cloud didn't cover him. He kind of rode the cloud out. The cloud took him, which is significant because you have these two fellows who are angels, so why are you staring up in the sky? He's going to come back the same way. So when we read in Revelation, Sunday, last Sunday, Sunday before, it actually tells us this is exactly how he's going to come back. Right? He's going to come on the clouds and every eye will see him and every knee will bow. Uh, wrong, way wrong. There we go. Wow. I actually think I was in the right place. This is like 11. Anyway, I don't have the reference right in front of me. So it's in kind of near the end of the first sevenfold vision, beginning of the second. I think it's the second sevenfold vision. I think it's in the trumpets, seven trumpets, where they see, um, they see like Christ the victor. Revelation 12, you see Christ the victor comes descending on a cloud, just like he ascended on a cloud. So we're going to see him come back exactly the way he left. Uh, so you just don't sit there staring. I mean, look up once in a while, because that is how he's coming back. And no, not yet, so we still have stuff to do here. Uh, you can't just stand there staring up the clouds forever. You don't know when he's coming back. Just get on with it. All right, so they return to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's journey away. Anybody know how far a Sabbath day journey is? Is it 12 hours? No. Hours. Sabbath day's journey. Distance. Oh. Half a mile. Yep. It's 1,056 yards, 3,168 feet. Um, 2,000 cubits. It, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a bunch of cubits. <laughs> 2,000 cubits. I wrote 2,000. Yeah, that sounds right. 18 inches in a cubit. So it's 0.6 miles, roughly. So what, what's a Sabbath day? Well, that's how long you... Anything longer than that is work. So you can't do that on the Sabbath. So you're allowed to go 0.6 miles on the Sabbath, and that's it. So if Grandma lives more than 0.6 miles away, you cannot go see her. Grandma, I can't come see you until after the Sabbath, because going to visit you now would be work. Right? 
not really that facetious, but yeah, so that's what a Sabbath day journey is. You're not allowed to travel any further than that. Uh, and this is, the, the measurement was derived from a tradition based on Israel's encampments in the wilderness. The tents furthest out of the camp's perimeter were 2,000 cubits from the center. Ooh. Tabernacle. The longest distance anyone had to walk to reach the tabernacle on Sabbath. Neat. I did not know that. That's useful. That's a neat fact. Thank you. Okay, so they're still in the upper room. It's the upper room for Monday, Thursday. There are a lot of stuff happening in that upper room. They're still there where they were staying, and they said, hey, this is the last, only place you see all the apostles named in a list. Why Judas? Why, why Judas what? Why is, uh, Judas wasn't there then. No, and different is, Judas. Is there another Judas? Different Judas. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it, <laughs> see, it depends on if, you're, if they're using Greek names and or Hebrew names, mm -hmm. right? Like Peter, that's his Hebrew name. Right. You know, Cephas, that's his Greek name. Or Peter, I'm sorry, that Peter is his like Roman name, Latinized name. And then Cephas is uh, Greek for, you know, Peter. And the son of James, there's already a James. You've got James and a Judas. <laughs> right, because you got like James the Elder, James the Younger. It, you know, it gets confusing. <laughs> and it doesn't get any better in the early church fathers. you got everybody with the same name. They're all yeah. got the same name. Just like there's a John the Elder floating around, and he's not John the Evangelist. Yep. Okay, so all of them are listed. The only time this list occurs like that. Also with the women disciples, of which there are many, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, they call, mention her. Uh, and his brothers, and everybody should probably have a footnote that says that just said anthropon, which can mean men as in the race of men. It means men and women, and it can just mean men. They just have the one word for that. Uh, okay, and then Peter stood up because he is the first among equals. And how many people were there totally? About 120. What's the significance of that number? Does anybody know? I'm sorry, uh, the significance of 120 people being in one place like that. I don't know. Mm. Kind of a fun fact. Okay, so 120 people is the minimum number you have to have for a viable synagogue. If you want, if you want to call your gathering a synagogue, call it a church. You needed to have 120 people. That's why. That was their quorum. Yep, and guess what? That's how the church starts. Where the church started. That's the first church. 120 people. Jesus was a Jew. <laughs> So he's like, yeah, even, even this, we're going to start it. So people go, there was 120 people there. And everybody's going to go, that's kosher, literally. <laughs> like, oh, it's good, right? That's enough. That's how church started. Okay, and they quote these uh, couple of quotations from the book of Psalms, talking about why, uh, why this field is not going to be good for anything that Judas bought and then why they had to replace him. So I'm getting, I'm going ahead of myself here. We still haven't talked about restoring the kingdom in Israel. Uh, the disciples still thought that Jesus was going to do away with the old world right then and there, that maybe the new world to come was coming like right then. Uh, so they were still confused. Um, it has nothing to do with the state of Israel. Uh, has nothing to do with um, the New Jerusalem, even even Zion, the new you know the new uh, the new heavens, new earth. Any of that it has nothing to do with that. Uh, some people want to make it into that. That you know, don't forget we have to reestablish you know the, the temple in Jerusalem where Jesus isn't coming again. N no, and that's not how it works. That has nothing to do with anything. Um, there will be. A new Jerusalem, which descends out of heaven, which has no temple in it, which Revelation tells us that. But people that misinterpret all of the ap apocalyptic stuff wind up saying, oh, we have to support the state of Israel because if something happens to the state of Israel and the Jews don't have a homeland upon which to build a new temple someday, Jesus can't come back. There is no truth to that whatsoever. But American evangelicals 
really have latched onto that for why we have to support the state of Israel and all this stuff. As Christians, we have we have to support them because they have to have that homeland because the temple has to be rebuilt because Jesus won't come again if they don't. But none of that's true. None of that's true. It's complete hogwash. There's nothing in the Bible about this. Uh, you can vaguely start to distill it and if you want things to mean what you want them to mean, you can twist it that way. But there's no biblical reason why we have to support a state of Israel. That's not true. Uh, it's probably a good, good thing for them to have a homeland, but we don't, we don't have to, as a people, to uh, against all costs, make sure that nothing happens to them. That's nonsense. That is not going to... We have no control over Jesus coming back. You know, otherwise, well, why don't we, why doesn't, like, someone rich just go build a temple and you come back right away, right? That's nonsense. Uh, but people want to make that about that, and it's not about that. Uh, even our speculation about when the end is going to be is pointless. You know, as Jesus says, you know, only the, when he was on earth, he said, only the Father knows. Because Jesus didn't use his full capacity as God while he was on earth. Um. Uh, Another point I wanted to make. Right, oh, this whole uh, being witnesses in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit will, the power will come to them when the Holy Spirit comes about them, and they will, they will be bearing witness. Uh, bearing witness is, I'll just quote Luther. Uh, bearing witness is nothing but God's word spoken by angels or men. So whenever we speak God's word, we're bearing witness because we're speaking the truth, and it calls for faith. Uh, from Jerusalem, if you look at the outline of the book of Acts, you know, it says, from Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Jerusalem, Acts chapters 1 through 7. Judea and Samaria, Acts chapters 8 through 12. And to the ends of the earth, which means Rome, Rome uh, Acts 13 to 28. So because the ends of the earth begins at Rome and goes, because all roads lead from Rome to the rest of the world. Uh, so you'll see that that's what takes place with the book of Acts. Um, verse 8. Nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. I can't read my own writing, sorry. Uh, the cloud, of course, is the Old Testament symbol of, symbol of God's presence. Leave, it will return in a supernatural way, just the same way that he, uh, he'll return the same way he left. Okay, angels. Angels always show up at key things, right? Because they're like, her especially a herald angel, or the herald angels, right? A herald angel is someone that announces something. So they show up at all the important uh, things like especially in Jesus' life, all the key events of Jesus' life, the angel shows up, which would be the Annunciation. <coughs> hey, you're going to be the God's handmaiden and you're going to give birth to the Messiah. Annunciation. So, Gabriel. Angels were there at his birth, right? The actual herald angels. He would, they were there at the Garden of Gethsemane. They were there at the resurrection. And then they're here at the ascension. So anytime anything, big things happened in Jesus' life, angels were there. Uh, or, or other witnesses like Mount of Transfiguration. You had, you know, uh, Moses and Elijah and so forth. Let's see. All right, so now let's get into Matthias. So back in the upper room, someone's got to replace us because Judas. This account of Judas's death is different from Matthew. Um, don't let that <coughs> bother you, because they can be... Don't make too big of trying to, like, codify them together or merge them together either. Like, oh, he was hung, and he hung there for a while, and then his body rotted and fell, and then his bowels gushed out when he fell off the tree, and boom, right? I mean, you can... That's plausible, but yeah, just don't make too much of it. Um, there's two different accounts. They're completely different. They doesn't mean that they didn't things didn't happen exactly both those ways at the same time that events 
are recorded from different perspectives. Um, and remember the eyewitness accounts too. No two eyewitnesses better not have the same story because it means they uh, got together and got their story straight. Uh, let's see. So he bought this field and it became known as Akeldama, Field of Blood. And so they couldn't... Uh, the reason Luke makes a big deal about it, and this is kind of a bit of a literary convention, that he's really focusing on this incident of however it happened, that his body fell headlong in this field and his bowels gushed out. This field that he bought with blood money, which is why it's called Field of Blood, right? Which is why the... Uh, yeah, that's why the, the Sanhedrin couldn't do anything with the 30 pieces of silver that Judas threw back at them. They couldn't do anything with that because they used that money to order a hit, basically, to betray someone to be killed. They couldn't, do, they couldn't put that money in the temple. It was blood money. So this field was bought uh, with blood money for... I think they used the, the Sanhedrin used it to buy the field. So it was purchased with blood money. They're the ones that purchased the field. And uh, so everybody called it, everybody knew that's what it was. And Luke makes a focus of that because people who focus on, people who, one of Luke's themes is people who are spiritually unsatisfied focus on material things. So they don't have spiritual satisfaction, so they indulge in worldly things. Like, okay, sounds like everybody on earth, right? At one time or another. So Judas, Judas was the one they used to like steal money. You know, that he was very focused on money. So here he was spiritually dissatisfied. He could have repented and gone to Jesus, but he didn't. Instead, he took the money, uh, and that was his undoing. And you're going to see that come up again with uh, Sapphira and the other one we're going to get to in a couple chapters. Why can't I remember her name? his name? Uh, <coughs> Ananias. never remember his name. Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, they're going to uh, die, uh, and it involves money. So it's going to be it's going to be a parallel theme, and you're going to see that it's going to be like <coughs> Judas all over again. Uh, and that's why it seems that's why Luke chose to focus on these details, different from the account we have in Matthew of Judas's going out and hanging himself. Notice in Matthew's account, you really get the sense of you know he's bad pun. He's at the end of his rope. He's sorrowful for what he's done. Is he repentant? Is Judas in hell? Maybe not. Uh, not going to say su suicides don't go to hell. That's not an automatic go to hell sentence. There's one unforgivable sin. Uh, anybody tells you different, show me in the Bible where it says that. <coughs> so, what do you say? Suicide is a suicide is not an unforgivable sin. People want to say, oh, well, if you commit suicide, you automatically go to hell. That's not. Catholic Church says that. The Roman Catholic Church says that. It's a psychological that. state of mind you're in. Hmm? You right. Know, kind of state I of mean, mind. You, you can be in complete mental despair and take your own life and, right. dead, and feel bad about doing it and know it's wrong. That's right. And do it anyway. Because so I had the, one cousin, at least, commit suicide. And he went out special and bought a gun. Hmm? Never owned one. Went out, sat down in the park, and shot himself. Mm -hmm. And they'll never really know why. No, nope. and and there's no way for us to. I mean, it's not for us to say anyway. No, I know we can't. You know, we can't judge. So if, if he was a baptized child of God, there's hope. Yeah. And that's we pr we trust in that hope. So don't. I hate it when people say well, with somebody commits suicide, they're in hell. Yeah, Dante put Judas in the ninth circle of hell. It's a poem, people. I mean, but it such pervades our culture so much. You're just like, oh, yeah, Judas, he's like the worst guy ever. Really? I mean, yeah, he's pretty bad, but no. The Bible doesn't tell us these things. So, that's why, you but, need, that's why you need to know your Bible. Yeah, and you really get that sense in Matthew that <clears throat> he could have, there's something going on between his ears that, that is not so black and white that we like to make it. In Luke, it's black and white. Judas is bad, okay? That this worldliness and this focus on worldliness, this is a theme that's going to be throughout Luke. Uh, that's like, there is nothing here when you read this. It was just like, he's detestable. There is no hint of redemption. There is no hint of hope. It's like, Judas is a bad guy. And he 
killed himself and hmm, got what he deserved. That's what you that's what you read when you read Luke about Judas. So he's mentioned the other eleven, and he's mentioned this guy, and says, Well, it would be good for us. Because Jesus did Jesus tell him to do this? Before he left to say, Hey, by, by the way, you guys gotta replace Judas. He did not. Jesus didn't tell him to replace it, to replace him. But they thought, well, this would be a good idea. Why? Because these people were with him. <coughs> they were with Jesus from the beginning, at least his baptism. So they could be witnesses to Jesus' life. There's and a lot more left. Yeah, but another, another one never hurts. No. <laughs> I mean, was, if you're going to choose from somebody... Because there were 12 originally. Even numbers. Right. And the number 12 is important. I mean, God chooses, chooses that number 12 a lot for a reason. Mm -hmm. So number 12 from our Revelation study, all these things have to do with each other. So that number 12 is a significant... The numbers in the Bible mean things, period. Okay. Uh, most of the time. Number 12 is significant because it means God's people. That's the number 12. So why are there 12 tribes? God's people, all of God's people. Oh, so the apostles being not, Jews would not have some of God, Not some of God's people, all of God's people, the number 12. So the number 11 is incomplete. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, you know, put it in 12th man, right? Uh, so it's like, okay, there's a couple guys. We'll pick out of these guys. They had criteria. Like, how do we pick apostles? Oh. Well, they had to be here from the beginning. They have to be here from when Jesus was baptized by John all the way through to right now. Had to be there. So we got two guys that can say they did that or that were wanted to put on that kind of work. Do they really, do they know what they're getting into? They're going to die. The only one that's not going to die is John. John dies a natural death. Judas is already dead. All those 11 guys other than John, 10 of those guys are going to die and Matthias also martyred all of them. Horrible deaths, if the traditions are anything to go by. You know, not easy deaths, terrible deaths. And also Paul and Stephen and a lot of a lot of the early Christians. So they give us, they don't tell us anything about Matthias. It's like, oh, and Matthias. But we have Barsabbas, who is also called Justice. Uh, Joseph called Barsabbas, who is also called Justice. This guy's got three names. So they know who he is. And also, you know, Matthias. And they're like, oh, we have to pick them, but we don't want to pick them. Why do you think that was? Why did they, like, okay, so it's a, Lord, you know who you want to be the guy. Okay, let's, like, throw stones, draw the short straw, whatever. Cast a lot for it. Why? Why did they do that? What do you think? That was their dependence upon the Lord. Mm-hmm. Yes. Which was good. Absolutely. Well, you can't have go you ever wrong that, you have you go wrong that way. Secret ballot, basically. Have you ever promoted anybody from within when you have two equally qualified candidates? Well, yeah. well, okay. How did the guy that didn't get the job feel? He felt like, well, you know, okay, he will, he's the better guy because he got the job. I must come up short. And I'm always going to be that guy that comes up as, you know, I'm the one that came up short. They have to live with these people. Yeah, they put it on the Lord, which is exactly what they had to do. But it had to be, it's like, okay, these guys are equally 100% qualified. If they could have said, hey, this guy's the outlier, that's the guy, that would have been the guy. But it's like, no, these guys are, it's too close to call. Lord, you know who it should be. You know, load the dice for us. You pick them. Because we are in this ministry together after that moment. And that would be a little awkward, don't you think? Because... You, you don't want disgruntled ex-employees from day one starting your church. Now, it's probably a horrible way to say it, but it's the truth. Because they have enough enemies. I mean, first off, they're already secretly meeting because they're afraid of getting killed. It's going to get worse, and then it's going to get really bad, and then it's going to get worse still before it gets better. So they kind of want to do things right. And so they, they're doing things by, yeah, putting it in God's hands is absolutely the right thing to do. So no one can say... Well, you picked a favorite, or you know, they look at this, uh, or and what if the new guy turns out and he's another Judas, and he sells the boat to the Romans, right? 
And they're like, that's the guy you picked? Well, what about the other guy? You know, he's all right. What, look at what this guy did. You know, the Lord works in mysterious ways, so. Well, the Lord knows everybody's heart. Yeah, right. Yeah, so I'm making a little light of it, making a little fun of it, but the reality is, is, wow, that's a tough way to start. Yeah, so they left it in God's hands, which is the best way to do these things. But then no one could accuse them of playing favorites, right? And what is the story of the church for 1,100, 1,500 years, the next 1,500 years? After, well, not that long, but like for 1,000 years, the church is pretty corrupt with a lot of favoritism and a lot of stupid things taking place about money. All the things that the evangelists warned us about, that the apostles warned us about. I mean, do you ever notice how many times... We don't know too many people that are really rich in our congregation, but there's an awful lot of stuff about not loving money in the Bible. Why? Because it's pretty hard to like money and love God because, man, money's corrupting. Because all the problems of the world come from that. Not that people can't be rich and be good Christians, but, man, it's hard. <laughs> if, you, if your first love is the money, there's going to be trouble. All right, so all of that is running through these guys' heads, all of a sudden they're kind of sharp. And they're like, yeah, you know what? We need to do this right. We need to do this fair and impartial because we don't want anybody casting doubt on your first decision that they make before they even start. Uh, this ruins the church's credibility. And then we, what you don't want is your ruined credibility casting a shadow on the gospel of Christ because... That's pure, that's right. But if they're going to judge Jesus based on what you do, that's not good. So you need to be above reproach, as Paul's going to write to Timothy, right? The uh, criteria for being a pastor is supposed to be above reproach, which I'll let you get back to you on how I'm doing on that. But then, you know, it's a tall order. It's a tall order. Okay, so apostleship specifically, apostleship, because the apostles are the sent ones, right? That's what the word apostle, apostolos means, the sent ones. So you have these guys that Jesus sent them, and now the Holy Spirit is going to be the one sending them, and then they are going to be responsible for laying on hands to all these other guys and go, you're a pastor now, you take care of these people, and you're a pastor now, and you take care of these people, and you go start a church over there, and then I'll send you somebody to help, and then you guys be the pastor of that church, and then you start making other pastors and send them to make more churches. See how that starts? Now, if that starts from a bad seed, or, or a questionable origin, it all falls down, right? Before you even get to the truth of Jesus was who he said he was and did the things that they said he did, Right? And that's the problem with every other religion in the world. Islam. The angel Gabriel came to Muhammad in a cave and dictated the Quran to him. Great. He's the only guy that heard it. All right. The angel Moroni came and buried, told Joseph Smith to dig up some plates and some seer stones and translate it and make the Book of Mormon. Great. He's the only guy that did it. Did Jesus write the Bible? We know God wrote the Bible. He inspired the earthly authors to write the Bible. But did Jesus write the Bible? No. Did Jesus start a church? No. He sent his apostles to begin the church. It begins here on Pentecost. So you have not the word of one guy. You have the word of a bunch of guys, like 500 people that Jesus appeared to after his crucifixion, before his ascension. And from there, so this eyewitness thing is important. But they're not taking the word of just one guy in a cave getting messages from an angel. I mean, L. Ron Hubbard <laughs> made an entire religion to swindle rich people by writing a science fiction story and calling it a religion about Xenu and the magic spaceships and volcano spirits and all that nonsense. Again, one guy. Uh... Jehovah's Witnesses, two guys. There's two guys. But still, two guys started it themselves, right? They were in cahoots. Well, one came quickly after the other and picked up the mantle. But 
Any religion started by one guy is a false religion. Every other religion in the world is like that. And it's all based on their scripture comes from the word of one fellow. Not so with the Bible. Not so with the Hebrew scriptures. 44 some odd authors. And all of these books, and this turned into a really quick apologetics lesson, sorry about that, but then all of these authors, all of these texts, through all of these pages, and you look at your cross-reference chains, right, and look at how everything, that ain't by accident. That's the divine inspiration at work. So that can't just happen. So that's how you know it's divinely inspired. But over all those centuries and all those places and times and languages, it's amazing. Well, because it's the word of God. It's a whole lot better story than a guy just talked to you in a cave one day because you heard a voice. Sorry. All right, so that's enough of my ranting about false religions and about the inspiration of Scripture. But that's what the inspiration of Scripture is all about. Okay. So that is how why they picked Matthias. That's why they replaced him in the first place because it was important to them to have 12 sent ones because Jesus started out with 12 sent ones. We should make sure we have the 12 that he originally sent to send out because there's 12 tribes and you know that carries on into the book of Revelation. You have the 24 elders because you have the 12 elders of the old covenant and the 12 elders of the new covenant. So you have the 12 patriarchs, 12 apostles. It all comes together, boom. At number 12, the people, all of God's people. And if you start multiplying together, like 12 times 2 is 24, I really mean God's people. And if you multiply it by 144,000, you get really every single one of God's people. And this time I mean it, all of them. It just intensifies it when you multiply it by big numbers. So that 144,000, sorry, Jehovah's Witnesses, that's how many people are in the high level of heaven or heaven. That, that's all of God's people. I really mean all God's people. That's all that means. So 12. And then they went out from there. And that probably has something to do with why the Jews picked the 120. Right? Because you have all of God's people, 120 people there to start a synagogue. All right. That's chapter like one. Notice what they were doing already. They were, you know... Uh, they were already spending their time in prayer, right? What 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 does the church community do? We pray, we spend time in the Word, and breaking of the bread, right? The Lord's Supper, and that's what they were doing, and that's what they're going to do until the Spirit comes on Pentecost. And we'll just go ahead and start with Pentecost. Start on Pentecost. We'll leave that for that. So now we move on to chapter two. We'll do the first part, and we'll do. You know, Peter's sermon goes on for a couple chapters because, you know, it's Peter and more than one sermon. So we'll just start and we'll just talk about that. All right, so chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived and they were all together in one place, same place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and at the sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? Ah, oh, they could all have been Lutherans. <laughs> but others, mocking, said that they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. That's 9 a.m. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Immediately, Peter, first Christian pastor, giving the first Christian sermon, first thing he does, quotes scripture. 
And in these last days, it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. When your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel know, therefore, for certain, that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And that's where our reading in church usually ends. And that's where we'll stop for this week. Or the reading. Now we'll talk about it. Okay, so the day of Pentecost arrived. They were all in the upper room, and there came from heaven a sound like a mighty wind. Okay. Wind is an often the whole rushing wind that's a presence of God thing. So you have that uh, when, what is it, when Elijah's in the cave, when Moses is in the mountain, God's going to show him his back as he goes, you always have the sound of the mighty rushing wind. So that's an indication of, and clouds and flames too, basically big upheavals in the sky. That's kind of a manifestation of God's power. 50 days after the Passover Sabbath, as we talked about already. And you know, it kind of, these manifestations, they're kind of a little weird. So it's a sound like a mighty rushing wind. It doesn't say there was a mighty rushing wind. It was a sound like there was a big wind. And then you have these divided tongues as a fire. It doesn't say they actually had fire on their head. Was it fire on their head? Maybe. But it was like fire. So these, these things appeared to them that they had no way to express what this was they saw. They tried to put it in words the best they can. And rested on every one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, interesting, there is an interesting uh, Greek word here when he says, and they said house? Yeah, they filled the entire house where they were sitting. He's using oikos there for the word house, which Luke only uses, also uses to mean the temple, which makes sense because they're in an upper room. What are they doing in the upper room? Pray. If they're praying and breaking bread, they're having church. There's 120 of them. So it's church, it's worship, right? So it is a house, that's where they're living, but it is also a house of God in Oikos. It's a church. Uh, It's just one of those fun words that means both things, and here it means both of those things. And all of a sudden, they get a special dose. I like to call it a special dose of the Holy Spirit. Um. Do you think there are men out there, maybe women too, but they get this sort of a calling? 
to be able to like speak in yeah, tongues? Yeah, just to be something special. Or yeah, let's talk about that in a minute. Yeah. And by in a minute, I mean I'll be right back because I just drink all this stupid tea, which means I have to go. Have you ever met or seen anybody that claims to have done that? What? I'm sorry. Speak yes, in speaking tongues. Oh, yeah. boy. I worked with a guy who said his wife could do that. <coughs> I worked with a man who he said his wife could speak in tongues. Oh. I didn't hear it, but he told me that she does it. So. I wonder what he hears or what, he, what she thinks she hears. Yeah. Oh. The church that I attend. <laughs> Pardon me? I said, uh, Lake Erie Church of God. Uh, they. It, it, when I say speak in tongues, it's nothing that, I mean, they, they, they do. And they say that, I know one Sunday, um, dear lady, and, I, and anyway, she spoke in tongues and during the sermon. Or and she began to speak in tongues as Pastor was preaching. And he, got, he stopped. And everything just got quiet until she got finished. And I assume what he said after that was interpreting what she said. And that, to this very day, and I'm not saying that it, 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 it's not, you know, it's just kind of those question marks, you know. That, and, and it says there has to be someone to interpret, so it, it, it's got to be something for real. But, uh, no, I'm serious. And every now really and then, it's somebody will, you know, you know, say something, but it, it didn't stop that time. I mean, he was in the middle of a sermon. And she just started speaking in tongues, and he, I, he just, I mean, just stopped, and everything was quiet until she finished. And then, as I would, and I assume what he's saying. I say, I believe what he said. It was an interpretation because it had nothing to do with his sermon. I mean, as far as the topic. So it, it was very did, did interesting. Did she understand what she was saying? Pardon? Did she understand what she I was saying? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. She just, because you don't discuss it afterward. Did it come to the coach? I mean, that's something that you would talk about after morning service. Did you understand what you were saying? But uh, I, I assume, but I, I don't know. I was supposed to do that with my service either. Did you but he, uh, <laughs> it was just kind of, all of a sudden, that, you know, you're, hey, don't it, it was a good sermon. You know, okay, when, I hit my head like, Or like, bend like, down and scratch it. <laughs> but it did, cool um, piece of furniture, probably. what he said, I don't remember the words, but it was relevant to a Christian, to the Christian belief, you know, but it just didn't, if it did, I missed the whole point. You know, I believed her, what he said, I believed what he was preaching, you know. Then after about three minutes, it, he went on with his sermon, you know, so. Has that ever happened in the Lutheran church that you know of? What's that? Speaking in tongues. Mm, not to my knowledge, See, unless they break out the beer early, no. I don't remember that at all in any Lutheran church. You know, I just wonder why some... Some denominations. Well, you can barely get a Lutheran to say amen where other people can hear him say it, let alone actually get <laughs> up and, you know. We're, we kind of got to stick up our butt, by the way. I mean, we really do. We did have a movement. So, all you Lutherans out there listening in like SoundCloud land, it's okay to say hallelujah, amen in church, even when your pastor's preaching. He might like that, actually. How about right on? <laughs> right on. We were in church in Oklahoma. <laughs> Well, it's Oklahoma. Methodist we went to a people's church in, in Geneva, and they, when he was preaching, that people would go out, "Amen." Yeah. And just you know, and they, they, and it wasn't just one person that kept saying that. There were several people in the congregation that did hmm? that so during the sermon. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah, one way to give it. feedback to the pastor. Well, you know, what's the word "I'm on me"? Let it be. Let it be. So let it be. So I think yes. the Lutherans are just so. Um, Uptight. Yeah, yeah. They, they, want to, they, they want to be. They want to quiet. They yeah, yeah. Quiet. I find that annoying though when someone. Yes. Does. Well, that's yeah. distracting. Exactly. It's distracting. That's, that's yeah. how we felt. Yeah, yeah, because the people, the one man was sitting behind us, and he kept he kept doing that, and you it's lose like, track of the sermon. Mm -hmm. It's like um, yeah, that, that's why people you lose agree track with of what sermon with what the pastor is saying. No, we we'll fall asleep. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Well. You should know when you, when you 
when you're in a Lutheran church, you, you can't change how they've been for so many years. Are they well, absolutely. Like, why do you, yeah. what's, why the you, what's the what's the puppet, the, the Muppet or whatever, that has the, the big nose, the blue guy? The, the, no, the no, eagle. No, the, the eagle. The eagle. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. That, staunch, stiff. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember his name, but yeah, it's exactly yeah. what he's like. Yeah, that's what it reminds me of. I can't remember his name. It's going to bug me now. I love the Muppet Show. <laughs> So you know what will happen in Lutheran Church if you do that? After service, I'm going to call you over and say, well, you really shouldn't be doing that. You know? <laughs> We've never done that before. <laughs> We've had people do that. that you were at the, yeah. I mean, what kind of denomination? It, it was, you're talking about when they said amen and stuff? Yeah, it um, was uh, People's, People's Church mm. on there Route 84 oh, oh, in yeah, yeah. Geneva. At the Baptist Church. Is well, it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. I mean that's why. <laughs> yeah, that okay. is a Baptist well, Church. Well, you know what they did? It was, you could have heard a pin drop in there because... The children got up and left before. It's time for children's church because children. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, what they, uh, don't get me true. started on that. My, <laughs> my old church was like that too. Like kids were not. Alive. Yeah. And it's like, or you know, the children can learn by the parents' example of how to behave in church, and when they don't Absolutely. understand what was said, their parents tell them what it meant. Because well, that's what their a job. Concept. Yeah, what wow. A concept. Instead of, oh, this isn't for you kids. Mm. <laughs> go to your class. So you go do crafts and eat crappy snacks now, and then when the grown ups are done worshiping God, you can come back. But you know so what? So you go at playtime now. If the children are in the service, not only does it give them behavior lessons, but I directed the children's choir at St. John's when we were members there. And I had, it was Easter Sunday, and I had all the kids sitting in the back on chairs, and I was sitting behind them, and Pastor either misspoke or he said something, that, and my son caught that. And he turned around to me, and he goes, Mama, that's not right. He said there weren't 12. There were only 11 disciples. Judas killed himself. I said, yes, I know. <laughs> we'll talk to Pastor after you got to send him straight about that. Wrong? <laughs> yeah. No, no, be, that was all talk. Because if kids are raised in, in the traditions, then they like don't need the hymnal because they know the liturgy. They know what comes next. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like Until they put a new hymnal out and they change everything. Yeah, that was unpleasant. We went from TLH to the new one. So it was like a jump from the King James to the ESV. But it's like bad. And I was like, okay, the liturgy is pretty close. But it's like, wow, the creed changed because they got rid of the King James the English. But still, it's not wrong. But it's just like. When you learned it the one way. I've been saying it this way my whole life, and all of a sudden the words change. That's a little weird. That's a little jarring. But and every once in a while it comes back and like put in the King James. I do it. See, we, I, see it. We, see we do it. Yep. Just, so does always. Pastor Freddie. And he's Always. out there in front of everybody. Everybody's like reading it out of the hymnal, and he's up there, and King bellowing. James in it. He's and, he, and he's bellowing King James <laughs> on top of it. I prefer King James. Yeah. Well, that's what I grew up with. The, the, the whole language has its place. And it's Especially pre, it's, the it's Christmas prettier. Look, story. I always read Luke 2 from King James. Number one, because I have it memorized, because I had to no. learn it. And then two, it's just prettier. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I always have Linus in the back of my head doing the speech from the. Because yes. it's how you memorized it. Yes. You memorized it by watching Linus do it. Because it's actually the way he does it is pretty good. So in my, my head, I actually have the cadence from Linus. So you'll actually laugh on Christmas Eve because like it does sound like Linus. And it came to pass in those days. There went out for a decree from Caesar Augustus. <laughs> yep. yeah. Saturday I went to a, well, uh, my granddaughter got married down at the St. John's Cathedral. And I was sitting there and I almost started back. And my spirit was chuckling because... As father was, because they, they had a whole mass and communion on you know, the whole thing. And I was sitting there, and as after, as, as part of it, parts of it were going on, and he say something, and I automatically <laughs> responded. You know, like, you're once a Catholic, I guess. Oh, no, I gonna, Don't you just hardwired to your brain. You know, yeah. with you, and also with you, you know. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't bad, you know, but it was just. Kind of funny, they just kind of rolled off. You, know? so you can take the lady out of the convent school, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Home, I couldn't say the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, yeah. So, so tongues. I mean, wow, we got sidetracked on that one, but that's all right. Yeah. yeah so, so tongues. Are there people in the world that are given the gift of language like that? I'm not going to say they're not. That they just all of a sudden wake up. I mean, weird things happen when people wake up from comas too. They can speak languages they never spoke before. 
that's different from this, obviously, but miracles happen, things happen. I'm not gonna say they don't happen, just like people are possessed by demons today. You know, it's not something that you see all the time, but it happens. People see it happen. That um, happened quite a bit in scripture. It still happens quite a bit, just not in places where people don't actually believe in spirits because it does. Yeah, there's uh, there's pastors in other countries who see it a lot, Lutheran pastors. They've written books. It's weird stuff, the whole other Bible study. Uh, yeah, so the whole idea of speaking in tongues now, though, speaking in tongues and somebody else has to interpret it? <laughs> eh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm not going to say that happens. I mean, maybe it happens. I don't believe it. But it's in here somewhere. Doesn't it say that? No. It says, uh, if if I speak in the tongue of men or angels and have not love, no. I'm a noisy gong no. clanging symbol. No, it just says everybody understood it in their own language. Everybody understood it in their own language. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. And in this passage, you're right. But right. I, I, I agree with that. But I'm just saying, uh, when you say that just, if someone speaks in tongues, does someone always interpret it? Is that, did I, did yeah, I it's like, the, like, like, the, in, like the Pentecostalism. If someone speaks in a tongue... Nobody else understands what that guy says, but someone right. else interprets it. Yeah. Now the spirit's moving that guy to understand what this guy just babbled, and I'm going to call it babble because that's where the word babble and tower babble comes from. And we'll get to that point because there's a reason I said it that way. Uh, <laughs> nobody else. That's of no value to anybody else. That this one person receives the inspiration to understand this per person's inspiration. Well, the interpreter interpretation is for those for everybody else. Yeah, maybe. I mean, am I going to say that can't happen? I'm going to doubt it heftily. I'm not going to say it can't happen. But these guys, like when these people speak in tongues, people understand them. Yeah. And it's interesting. Does it mean that each of the different people got a different language, and some of the people they were all talking at once, or was it? They were talking, and all these people who spoke different languages heard it in their own language, mm -hmm. but That's, they were speaking whatever they spoke. Maybe. That was my interpretation. Yeah, when you, was, when you read it that way, so these guys got up and spoke like Galilean dialected Hebrew, yeah, they were, Aramaic rather, yeah. and then all these people heard it in their own language. Yeah, that, mm. that's God's. That's, that's God. That's God. That's God. That's, God's, that's, right. that's God driving the verbs. So I like that. That's usually when God is doing the acting, you're probably interpreting it right. Uh, yeah, so this is a, a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit here because this is how things get started. Now, the reason I brought up Babel is, all right, so men refused to fill the earth, multiply, and, and have dominion over the earth, right? Men refused to leave right wherever they were kicked out of Eden and they settled. This is where men settled, right there. And they have all the rest of the ball to fill up, and they're not. They won't go away. So God said, I'm going to fix that. And so he confused their language. So now I don't know what you're saying. I'm going with people that I understand. And so they put in and distributed men over the earth. And so that was the Babel event, scattering people to the four corners of the earth, right? And Pentecost undoes that, right? So now, starting in Jerusalem, they're reversing Babel. Now the word is going out. Everybody in their own language is going to take that gospel home in their own language to wherever they are that they have filled the four corners of the earth. So it's going to undo what happened in Babel. There is a united, unifying language now, the language of the gospel. And that's the beginning, the birth of the church. When our languages were confused and now they're going to be simplified, they will be simplified. Everybody's going to hear God's word. It's a lot of countries. Okay, so, so all these people are from all these different places and they're all going to go home. So that they're going to church, people are going to believe. And we'll see that later that so many people were believed right then. There are so many thousand men believed, were baptized, and then took this home. So that's a heck of a church plant. Sending all those thousands of people home and now everybody's like, man, we got to get out there because they're going to want more. They're going to need pastors. They're going to need someone to guide them. So that was a big job from day one. I like the way it talks about uh, divided tongues as a fire, and the word tongue is the word uh, uh, tongue, right? So tongues as a fire appeared to them, distribute, distributed among them, and rested upon them. 
divided tongues appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak other tongues as the Spirit gave them the ability to talk. Because that's how the word spreads. Okay, you, can, you can publish all the Bibles you want. You can hand it to people and say, read this. But the way the word about Christ actually spreads is it comes out of somebody's mouth and goes in somebody else's ear hole and takes root. Uh, and if they're deaf, of course, we have other means of communication, but you know what I mean. It, it is the oral communication from one human being to another that spreads the gospel. Uh, put down on billboards is great. Maybe that converts somebody. I don't know. Anybody has been converted by a bulletin board. Advertising is not the thing, I guess. Maybe it does. I'm not going to say it doesn't. But it, it's that, it's that it's a very pers- God's a very personal God. I mean, God is God, and he became a person to fix all the stuff we broke and then stayed that way for eternity. And he communicated by walking around talking to people, right? He did pretty amazing things, but at the end of the day, it's his words that carry on. So it's all about speech. It's all about talking. So they heard the words that these guys were saying. They understood them, and they took them home, and then they repeated what they heard and saw, which is what Luke is doing with his gospel and with his book. He is repeating what he heard and saw, and he wrote it down. And the whole idea of reading, too, again, remember, when people say they read back then, it means I'm holding the book in my hand and I'm, I'm speaking the words out loud. That's what reading was. You didn't just silently read. You actually said it out loud. They didn't think you were crazy back then when you do that. Um, which is good training. If every, every now and then, maybe try it with like a psalm or a proverb or something. Like say it out loud because it trains your mouth too. It trains you to... They actually tell us to, when we read our Bible, like to go where people don't look at you like you're nuts. And actually whatever you're reading that day, read it out loud to yourself because it trains your mouth to be able to make the words correctly. Plus you hear it. And you hear it. And that commits it to memory too. Yep, yep, absolutely. So it's... Uh, keeps you from going to sleep. And it also keeps you from going to sleep. We will probably stop there. We will get into Peter's sermon next week because that's full of good stuff. And that's where we'll pick up them. Yeah, so that's from Joel. And that's got some pretty neat imagery in it, too. No, no, in the connection, it's kind of it's kind of interesting because we're doing Revelation on Sundays and doing this, that I'm making the connections in language, <coughs> and you realize that there's a lot of like apocalyptic language right here in Luke, which there is. I actually knew that, and, but just even knowing something and actually just going, ah, I see the connection, and it click. That's the other great thing about the Bible is it has all that stuff built into it. So that is where we'll stop for this week. Any questions or comments or anything like that? It will be more, more back to more. I have more structure to it starting next week. It was kind of freewheeling today, but that's okay. Nope, questions, anything? All right, then we will stop there.